Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Saturday Night Podcast. We're here with Paul Courtney from Ballyhagan, who is going to tell us his dream team today. Paul played for Ballyhagan and also transferred down to Dublin for a couple of years to play with St. Jude's. Well, he also has a Sigerson Cup medal with Queen's University and has also played for Armagh um, at senior level and under age. So, Paul, thanks very much for joining us and telling us your dream team. Thanks, Sean. Thanks for having me. Um, Paul, as I said, you have a um, Sigerson Cup medal with Queen's and an um, under-21 Ulster medal with Armand. They both came in the same year, 2007. Yeah, it was, geez, it was great. Uh, probably most of my successes came at, at an early age. and uh, But yeah, it was a couple of brilliant years from probably whenever I just started university with Queen's. Uh, got good coaching from 18, 19 years old and sort of brought that forward. And then go on the Sigurds and plan on as a bit of a shock whenever I was a fresher. And that development it gave me some confidence. And then sort of kicked on from that. I was on Sinai's in the Sports Institute of Northern Ireland. I was in that and that really developed because I'd never done any gym programs before. And it was sort of a, an unheard uh, thing where guys were doing gym for college or university or whatever. We were getting up a couple of mornings a week at six in the morning to go over to Jordanstein to do. Uh, some weights and stuff so that sort of added to the professionalism and all probably gathered into a window there of uh, of success we did the Brand Cup in December 2006 I think it was and then Sigerson in, in March 2007 on the 21 in April 2007 and then I think I went to America that summer and then got back from that and then I was called up the seniors and then the year after won Ulster with the seniors and I thought I thought that every year was going to be like that, to be honest. And uh, I haven't really won anything since the days, the So, uh, yeah, that's basically it. So, as you say, Paul, you, you've come on to tell us your best 15 and you've played with some top quality players um, throughout Ulster and throughout Ireland. And I suppose you were, you were sort of telling me off earlier that you've based your team on the players that you've played with most and that you had most success with. Yeah. I sort of deem it on like the guys there that I'll have good relationships with and I've played with at least a couple of years. And uh, I suppose that side of things, yeah, just in terms of guys there that I, that I really know, uh, that's what I based it on. So we'll start then, Paul, with your, your goalkeeper. And um, you've went with your own club, long, club man and Nets here to start with, Johnny McKeever. I actually thought you were putting me in that sir, if you were, but uh, I wasn't actually. <laughs> having goes. We'll discuss that later, Abby <laughs> <Robbie> Paul. <laughs> uh, no, the Johnny in, in their uh, number one. Uh, simple enough with Johnny there. Johnny's played club football for Bally Hagen for the seniors, I'd say probably 18 or 19 seasons now. Uh, his first year was actually in 2004. And we got an intermediate final. And Johnny would have been 15 or 16 then and starting an intermediate final in goals. And uh, from from playing goals before at minor and even seniors there or wherever, I know the pressure you're yeah, under. And, and to be fair to him, like, he is a guy there that uh, he, he does lose confidence whenever he's in there. He's very vocal. He's got a great long kick out. But I suppose 15 years ago or so, Johnny's kick out would have been 70 yards, 75, 80 yards if there was a bit of a win behind him. But the last few years, he's developed himself because of the kick out strategies of teams and whatever. And he's gotten into like a bot type kick, which would land around your, your head, which he's sort of developed uh, the last few years as well. So he's changed his game at the elder sort of side of his, of his years there, which is uh, great. Uh, but I suppose he's still only 32 or 33. He's a lot more to give Bolly Hagen and uh, so just goalie there. He was always going to be Johnny there. And your full back line then, Paul, you've picked a strong full back line. You've Andy Mullen, Brendan Donaghy and Kieran McKeever. And I suppose Donaghy and McKeever have been picked on a couple of teams so far, but Andy Mullen, I think you're the first to pick him. He's obviously a standout cornerback. He was for Armagh for years on throughout Ireland. Well, I think it's probably... Ali Mullen, for me, would be the best defender I've ever played with. Uh, and Brandy and, and Bricky would tell you that as well. Uh, he's an absolute clan machine. 
but it's his tackling speed. He has a, a massive amount of speed everywhere in his game. He's everything is just a hundred miles an hour, but he he can control that. And uh, he was always a hundred miles an hour, and he could catch a ball, he could kick and, and fist and stuff. And people talk about doing skills, but he could do the skills at one hundred percent. And it was the simple things that he always did well. He didn't talk much. That's one thing about Andy. But we see whenever he did talk, and especially in those couple of years, whenever I was on the panel there in 15 and 16, Andy was like, he, he just, whenever he spoke, everyone listened. He was there from 03. It was his first year on the yeah. panel, lost in the grand final. And he probably went from a fella there. He was nine and a half stone or something like that there. And he was, wasn't was much heavier than that, probably 11 stone whenever he finished up his arm back here. But... He was like a mountain within the game, a mountain within the team because he had so much respect. Uh, but yeah, he was a shoe in there at number at number number two. Uh, Brandy there, uh, Brandy's brilliant. Like Brand, we played Brandy there, right from underage, uh, on the twenty ones, seniors. But he's a great reader of the game. He's two footed. But Brandy has a very high skill level. So like Brandy could play. He plays full forward for the club. And uh, I marked him bits and pieces there the last couple of years. Like, and he's a serious, serious operator. Uh, Brandy, like, he's he's a gentleman on off the pitch as well, but he's actually deceptively quick. And uh, that's something that people think, oh, Brandy Donnie's getting 34. He he's too old for him and all this year. He's coming 35 and we're like Brandy. I seen Brandy last year playing for the club. Like, Brandy's a flyer. Like, whenever he gets going, he's like that John McEntee type, uh, elegant type sort of stride. And uh, he's really just deceptively quick. And uh, like I just said there now, he's a gentleman off off the pitch as well. But he can mix it up serious well there whenever he's uh, he's on it. Kieran uh, McKeever there, yeah. Uh, I know played with Kieran as well with the seniors back in late 2007, 8 and 9. And then obviously it was a couple of years as well. But... Uh, uh, Kieran McKeever's best position for me, like he might make uh, people saying this, but I think it's corner, cornerback and was probably the best game I ever seen him play was in the 05 All Ireland semi final against Stevie O'Neill. And maybe some younger uh, listeners might not remember, but uh, Stevie O'Neill scored 10 points off Francie in the Ulster final. He went to a replay and he wasn't, he didn't score much the second game, but the All Ireland semi final came and everyone was worried about who's going to mark Stevie O'Neill. And Kieran McKeever never gave him a kick. And he's that type of player, he'll do anything to the team. He's a real team player. He can play in any position that sort of front or sorry, the back eight and such or eight or eight or eight or nine, the sort of two to two to nine. And again, he, he's a great leader on the pitch and off the pitch. Uh and it's funny, he was never the quickest, but he would like me saying that. But I remember we were in a speed test. One day, and one of the boys turned around and said, and maybe he finished the, he maybe finished in the bottom half, and he just turned around to whoever was quickest, and they started slagging, and he says, "Stick a ball between the both of us and see who wins it." <laughs> <laughs> That's the type of player he is. He would he literally just go and get wired in and get stuck in, and uh, but he's a great, great, great man there to have in the full back mate. I don't think he'll thank you too much for sticking him in cornerback, Paul. I, I don't know if that was his favourite position or not. I think edge of the square, maybe. it <laughs> would be all right. He's a lucky. He actually made the fifteen there. <laughs> uh, we we'll move on to your half back line then. Um, with Jared O'Kane from Derry, who you won, um, who you played with in Queens, and then Plunkett McCormick from Ballyhagan, and Aaron Kiernan from um, Armagh, obviously as well then. Yeah, so uh, I've Jerry came there at five, uh, but uh, I played with Jerry whenever I was in Queens, and he was sent to half back whenever I was midfield, and we had a great relationship. And this is one of the examples where I'm sort of saying is that uh, I'm picking the team based on players that I've played with, and in terms of understanding and sort of seeing what they give to the team, or whatever. And excuse me, we had a, we had a great relationship playing. It was simple, really. Our game plan was if the opposition had the ball, I went back to Santa half back and Jerry Keane swept in front of Dan McYarden, who was the full back. And whenever we had the ball, we pushed up. Jared was a center half back, but Jared was a real driving force. 
in the half back line, he'd be up and down the field like a yo yo. Like, and he wasn't overly big, probably similar stature to Andy Mon. He wouldn't have been as quick as Andy Mon, but he would have been a better footballer than Andy. Uh, but again, a real presence within the group of players that we had. Uh, he was a brilliant reader of the game. He played fullback for Derry Miners in 2002. I think it was 2002, the year they won All Ireland. Ah, he was captain as well, yeah, 2002, the same year Armagh won All Ireland. And uh, he was a great passer as well, but he could always mix it up. Like, and, and that's the, that's what I loved about Jared. Like, he could always mix it up. And no matter if somebody's 15 stone come up, coming up again, he always got the hands in and, and quick hands and stuff, a bit like Andy again. And uh, yeah, that's why I have Jared in there. Plunkett there, like people who don't know who Plunkett is there, uh, Plunkett played for Ballyhagan for a serious amount of years. I played him for about 10 years, but he was unbelievable. Like, I, I don't understand how he never got on the Armagh panel. And even if you're ch- chatting to Flappy or Paddy McCabe or whatever, uh, they might know better. But uh, they would tell you as well, he was a serious footballer. He was a five foot nine. But it always seemed like he was like well over six foot whenever he was playing. He just, he was two footed. He was as strong as a bull. He's the type of fellow that would, if there was a landmine, he would have jumped on it. Like, that's how brave he was, like, if in terms of balls, he, he was a serious man. Like, um, but he was seriously dedicated as well. And I've actually never seen him play a bad game for Bolly Higgins. Now, I think there's maybe, maybe six or seven years he got Bobby Higgins senior player of the year and that's whenever we would have been tipping around senior championship as well in the early noughties and even in the mid in the mid noughties whenever we were a strong at the media team he would have been there knocking about back player of the year nearly every every year like he just gave his heart and soul into into the game like and uh, that's why he's there at uh, six uh, seven there is Arn Kiernan so have Arn in there played with him in 08 and 09 and everyone knows about Arne. Like, he go on all day about Arne. Just commitment side of things in terms of his skills and fitness is unbelievable. Like he would be up and down like Jared O'Kane, like a yo-yo. But again, he would be taking free kicks. He's obviously unbelievable going forward. Uh, but there's one thing about Arne that people maybe don't see is he always worked so hard on his weaknesses. And again, that's a really good thing. And he would have been a real gentleman to speak to off the pitch as well. Uh, and I suppose a lot of these guys and you know, all these guys that I spoke about and were on, on the team as well are real good guys off the pitch and would always want to help you and that's, that's one of the good, the good things as well about these guys uh, but Arne like, just a real classy, classy player like. In your midfield Paul um, two Arma legends here in the middle of the field you have Charlie Vernon who um, you played with at Queen's you won a Sigerson Cup with them. You won that under-21 Ulster with them. Um, and then, obviously, both of you got playing senior football for Armagh as well. And you have your club mate and club and county legend, Paul McGrain. That's your midfield. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I suppose Charlie there... Uh, put Charlie in eight. Was he wore eight and Flappy wore nine. So I put him, him in nine. Uh, but I played along with Charlie, yeah. Yeah. Uh, since Armagh on the 16s. I think that's whenever they joined up. It used to be North Armagh, Mid Armagh and South Armagh. I'm not sure what way it is now, but played with Charlie from Armagh on the 16s. It was obviously in St. Pat's Armagh with him as well. He was a year younger than me in school. Uh, but so would have played school level with him probably from the, he was the first year as a second year in Dalton Cup and all, but he was a serious player. Uh, Best relationship with Charlie Plain was probably with Queens. Uh, simple again, probably similar to the Jerry Kane relationship. It was like uh, Charlie was midfield along with me, and I was the defensive midfielder, and he was the attacking midfielder. And if you tell somebody that now, that's only known Charlie the last five or six years, they'd be like, she's Charlie Vernon, uh, uh, like an, an attacking midfielder. He was just a marauding midfielder. Like, it was time to be given the ball, and it was just, he just broke the line like a bullet. Like, and they, uh, Again, another guy there that would be whenever he gets going up at his pace, he's serious pace. Like, and uh, remember Mark and Marty Clark and under twenty one championship when everyone was going on about how quick Marty Clark was. Like, and Charlie never gave him a sniff. Like, and uh, so 
we would have played continuously for three years in Queens together, and we really had the relationship nailed. It was the defensive and offensive uh, midfielders, but probably another sort of level of Charlie's play was that he was so versatile. He played every lane in our bar goalie, like, but like we all know, only the best people who play goalie, like, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> uh, but he was a real leader on and off the pitch. And he was so dedicated. I actually remember him playing a game against Giorda College. And uh, there was a guy called uh, Michael Cusson from Cork was playing for Giorda College. And Michael Cusson was about six foot nine. But he was as broad as he was tall. He was huge. But he was, uh, he was marking, he was marking Charlie. Charlie just kept breaking the ball and breaking the ball whenever he's in midfield. In the last few minutes, that we were three or four up. semi final the Ryan Cup in 07, that's what it was. And he went into full forward and uh, I remember the ball came in. There was maybe a goal in at the very end. And the ball came in and Charlie jumped that high. His knee hit off the back of Cousins' head. And uh, then he gathered the breaking ball and he came out with the ball and then we won we won, we won, won, won the game. But it's those sort of types of things where nobody's ever going to see that much. There's probably only 10 or 15 people are at the game, but those sort of things stick in your head. He were. Uh, and a really good athlete. Um, McGrain there, uh, I was lucky to play with McGrain because he's probably one of the last of that generation uh, there that I got a good eight or nine years playing with him out of that really good uh, RMA team. Um, he was just, he's the strongest player I've ever ever, I've ever played with. I can't explain the strength he had. Uh, the great hands. He was a good passer. But the, probably the best thing he ever told uh, myself and, and probably people within the club was do the thing simple. And he always would have said, and he maybe forgets, because I, I said this to him a couple of weeks ago whenever we were in a cleanup with Bally Hagen. He said the difference between a good club player and a good county player is that a good county player will do the simple things right 100% of the time. So you're fisting, you're kicking, uh, you're getting him on to the outside and all that. He was uh, harped on about doing the simple things all the time. And I would say that's why he was probably one of the best, if not the best, midfielder that RMA have ever had because he always did the simple thing well. Uh, a great leader on and off the pitch, but he, he just demanded that level of perfection that was needed to perform at that top level. Like, and that's why uh, he's in there. He's also a great club man. Like the last... I don't know how many years, but the last number of years anyway, uh, he's helped drive the youth development within the club, which is uh, great. And so hopefully we'll see that the benefits that with Bally Hagen in the next the next few years. So we move on to our forward line then, We see Mark Sweeney, who you played with in Queen's University. Um, you have Paddy McKeever, obviously a young club man and another Armagh legend. And then Kevin McGordy uh, finishes your half forward line. Yeah, so... Uh, but Mark Sweeney in the right half forward, uh, and as you say, I played with Mark and Queens and St. Jude's, but it was probably the St. Jude's years whenever uh, I seen the best, um, best of Mark, because he'd be maybe two or three years younger than me, uh, so I would have nearly left Queens whenever he was uh, the man there. Uh, he's the fittest player I've probably ever played with, and he's seriously dedicated in terms of his training. A great passer uh, and one of the things there about him he always wants to improve himself he'd be probably 32 now like, but he always is, would be questioning listen how can I get better what can I do uh, how can I uh, get better skills based how can I get fitter and he'd be reading up articles and he'd be doing everything to get to make himself better and I think that would be a real good personality to have around the team and uh, Unbelievably strong as well, uh, and as I say, very committed. But he did play his best football there in Dublin club whenever he was uh, playing with St Jude's, and he's got a number of Dublin club all stars, uh, which is no mean feat considering the talent that was up against the uh, up against him in Dublin club football. Uh, Paddy McKeever there, uh, what can I say? The Paddy's an absolute class act, uh, seriously strong and fast. I've never seen somebody as big as him in terms of his size for how fast he was. Uh, and I do remember whenever I was younger, 
it's funny that you very rarely hear these now. Like I was in some Pat's arm and I was maybe a first or second year. And Paddy was playing seniors for Armagh. He started against Derry in 1998. And he was taking the free kicks against Derry. And he was in school the next day. And it's not too much. You know, too often now you see somebody uh, being still in school and then playing seniors and starting for him especially. Uh, but that's how good Paddy McKeever was. He was unbelievable like in terms of that talent. He, his passing, he, this flat pass that I would have called it, it was like a mixture between an outside of a boot and like an Aussie Rose type kick, just like a bullet uh, to you, and then spun back. Lovely to catch, and uh, um, he was just he could just do things with the ball that not many could. Uh, he was just unplayable on his uh, day, and I can't really remember anybody to be honest. I know we were in Division Two, like, and that's the time whenever there was four divisions, but I can't remember, remember anyone really getting the grip with him too well at club level. Uh, but uh, just pity now his playing career for the club got cut short because of a back injury. Um, but uh, we played a clash of the clans there a few years ago there, and uh, maybe two or three years ago, where you played for your for your family, and then against all the families within the parish, and he was he was playing, and they you could just see the class coming out of him, like, still kicking the ball with the outside side of the boot, and all. I was just thinking there. If I got him fit again, he could maybe step out this year for Bally Hagen, but I don't I don't think there's much chance of that now. Uh, the way he is with coaching. Uh, Kevin McGordy there, again, played with him in Queens for three years. And again, a guy there, really good relationship on the football pitch. Whenever the offence, uh, sorry, the opposition had the ball, uh, whenever we were in defence, he then started in the midfield, took my man whenever he went into the centre-half back and took Jerry Kane. So, as you can see, he had sort of picking guys there that had a good relationship on the pitch as well. But uh, he was so comfortable on the ball. He actually thought the ball was glued to his hands. He was that good on the ball. He could like rotate around in a 360 and you would think he's going real slow and whatever. And he, he'd always just be looking for the best pass to give. Uh, he wouldn't have been the best communicator on the field because he would have been given out. Uh, he would have been known to be a bit of a character uh, but great vision, great hands and uh, to be honest he could have been named anywhere in that front eight because he could play, he could mix it up with the best thing, even remember in 2001 against Armagh seniors Anthem were playing and Anthem gave them I think Anthem gave Armagh a take goal, maybe 2001 or else 2003 2003 it was the year I think was it? Well, maybe 2003 up in, up in uh, Casement was it? Yeah I, and I remember him because I remember then whenever he whenever I joined Queens then he was saying oh he says I've, I've roasted you arm on then before oh uh, this year but uh, again but he's just a real personality but an unbelievable footballer brilliant brilliant footballer and the the two boys we've talked about Paul uh, the two Bally Hagen boys Paul McGrain and Paddy McKeever um, like how I know how inspirational were they to you coming up obviously they were starting in the team in 2002 that won all Ireland like you were yeah. coming up watching them two men every Sunday play for Bally Hagen how big of an inspiration were they on your career like it's funny like you look and uh, I hope it is the same for all the young kids like, but I remember going to Bally Hagen games and just whenever I was a youngster like I um, just couldn't wait to play for Bally Hagen just looked down the pitch and was like oh Jesus I can't, I can't wait to play I can't wait to play football with these guys uh because they are so good. But it's funny, like, you never think you're going to get up to, you know, you never were at the level of the end base, but so you never get to think you're ever going to get up to even play with Bally Hagen Seniors. You think it's so far away, but now I'm coming 35 and it's like, it feels like, it feels like a blank in an eye, like, you know what I mean? So it's it's one of these things that say, uh, they were, they're just real good guys. Like, like Paul McGrain was up at a club clean up there two weeks ago. Started at half eight in the morning and seven o'clock it was pitch pitch black and he was still lifting uh lifting me three the shed sheds of trees and leaves and we're painting goalposts and uh generally cleaning up around the club like and he's still there. Like this, these guys are are like superstars like in, in my eyes and I hope other gays' eyes and you just see at the end of the day they're normal people and they want to help out and uh 
just down to earth people. Like the same with Paddy. Like Paddy's I, I, I get on so well with Paddy. Like, and uh, Paddy's a personality, like, different personality than McGrain. Uh, but he's a gentleman like, and uh, just real good guys to be, be with. Like, and we would have travelled in the car like, and we were in the room together, me and Paddy. And uh, great crack and all. Like, but he always would have given you good advice good advice, always wanted, wanted you to be the best player that you can be there. So, uh, no, good, really good case. Eh? We'll see your full forward line then. Um, we have Stephen McDonald, Ronan Clark and Brian Mullen. That was Armagh's forward line, full forward line, sorry, for a couple of years, probably that, yeah. um, in around 2005 and that um, Ashley McConville would have been about two, but them, them three boys would have been Armagh's full forward line for a couple of years. Aye, so... Uh, Listen, only really played with these guys uh, was Stevie and Clarkie in 08 and 09, but I just couldn't leave them out because uh, that was my first year on the panel was 2008. And uh, like you were going again, you were in, you're just starstruck like whenever you're going into training. And again, you thought these guys were like gods, like, and you were going in and you're sitting beside them. But again, like they're complete gentlemen, like, and they, uh, but I suppose there's not much really more you can add to Stevie than what people know, but like, he's just two-footed. But he always practiced, a bit like Andy Manley, always would have practiced shooting at 100% pace. And I would say that's why he was so good on both. Like, and I think he wrote an article recently about people being two-footed. Like, and that's where I always would have practiced flat out on both feet because you never know whenever you need to change it up. And it would be okay on, on, on the left, but like Stephen McDonnell is like somebody who you have to watch like a hawk with both feet. He's that good. Uh, and he's deceptively strong as well. Like I, I seen us in training like, and killing one another uh, in our, in our mad training back in them days. And like the forwards were just as hard to tackle you as the backs. It was ridiculous. Like, it was it was war. Like, that's, and like, it brings me on to Clark here. Uh, and Clarkie, people don't realise how good he was whenever if you're a certain age. Uh, like he was again first year in university, just li- just after finishing school, first year of university, scored three points in playoffs, Seamus Mining and all Ireland final. But not only that, he kicked on again. He kicked on again and again and again. He was unreal. Like, uh, I remember we were in a training week in Portugal in 2008 and we had a tunnel, say it was a, a five yard tunnel. And you had to get past, maybe say, uh, Ronan Clark, and then you had to get past McGrain behind, right? Uh, and I remember going up again, Ronan Clark, and for 30 seconds, I couldn't get past him. I had to just, I had to give up because he couldn't get past him. He was so strong. And the guy would have been strong enough too, but he was an animal. Like, he, this is Clark, a full forward. And you wouldn't think a full forward would be uh, that good, but his hands, his tackling, and again, he was he was so dedicated. Like, but the uh, injuries caught up with him too. Like, he, he did the cruise shit, and then he did a bad Achilles tear. Uh, but he was he was unbelievable. Like, uh, Brian Mullen there I played with him a bit longer now. I played with him in 06 and 05, 05 and 06, yeah, with Queens. And uh, he was vice captain actually in 06 whenever we were beating the Sigerson final, and he's playing 05 whenever we we're beating the Sigerson final too. So, lengthily enough. Uh, spans of a, of a season in Queens back then because you had your Ryan Cup and they always did well in the Ryan Cup. You maybe five or six games there. In the McKenna Cup, you always had at least three or four games there, uh, depending if you got the semi-final or a final. And then, obviously, then you're Sigerson and we got to uh, three finals in a row. Uh, so, played a lot, lot with Brian. And, uh, but his nickname was Bull. And I actually don't know if it was because his dad owned a butcher's. Uh, or he was a strong and people are probably watching this laughing the heads off oh it's because of one or the, one or the other but he was an animal Brian Mallon five foot eight or nine and uh, he would go through a wall like he was so strong and uh, again both footed like Clark and Steve McDonald there like that full forward there line there I would say would be very hard to match in terms of because they're both footed and equally nearly as as simple or sorry as a good in both like uh, I remember seeing Brian Mann scoring a 50 off the ground with his left foot. Uh, like that's that's the level of what you were at there. Uh, Brian had great vision. Uh, he was very fast. Uh, I mean, he did he did have it all. Like he did a great mixture of everything. And 
very brave as well. And he got a bad injury uh, in pre-season 2009. Uh, it was before Christmas, I remember. It was in Callum Bridge and uh, he fell awkward being attacked on the Davis cruise ship. Uh, so he, like, he still came back from that and he played like, but one uh, he was a great, he was a great father, like. and just uh, again a real gentleman too. Like you meet Brian along the street, no worries, graces about him. Uh, get on well with him. Even played Porter down a couple of years ago in the championship, and uh, people coming to the end of his career, like, and he still was doing a doing a real good job for me. I think something that stood out when you're talking about them three, Paul, was their ability. Even till, like, we know them as two footed scores, but their ability to tackle and to work hard for the team. And that was probably something that that great Armagh team and that team that you you were coming on to as well, that was something that they had about them was their their work rate and their tackling, even in the forward line. Yeah. Like, serious, uh, it was just a nightmare. Like, uh, we used to do one-on-ones, like, uh, and uh, that was hard enough. And then one year, it was actually after the... Off the final 2008, we drew with Fermanagh and we lost so many balls in the uh, tackle. And Peter McDonald said, Right, uh, 17 versus 17 between the two 45s, and you have to take two touches. I think it lasted about a minute because there was not much blood because bites just got busted. Like. And then he sat back and he says, You're not walking the tackle anymore with the ball. And I, I can't explain again. There was rows of them. There was, there was, uh, and just the atmosphere of training was very tense. There was a lot of pressure of those trains. You were nearly going to train on them at them times, and nearly like a tizzy, nearly thinking, Jesus, who may want to mark in the day and whatever. But in a way, that was good. Like that was the competition for the places. Uh, you could be like if you were. I think I was doing maybe wing half forward back then in training for most of the training games. And maybe you can mark him uh, Granny Daddy one 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 day and then you'd mark an Aaron Cairn in the next or maybe mark him Paul Duffy. And Paul Duffy's an adult player. He's an absolute nightmare to be honest. He's one of the best players that say Pierce O's had ever had. I chatting a few people and said he's he was the best player maybe Pierce O's had there for the last few years. Like so the the level of quality that was there was serious, but those those three lads there, like Unbelievable, uh, and Ashley McConville obviously, uh, he was, was unbelievable. And uh, but as I said, Dave, from the start, I'm picking the team based on whenever I played with these players, what they were like at that time on that team I was particularly with. So those guys were were the best at the time for me. We'll take a look at your bench here, then, and you've heard me showing some bench as well here. Um, so we'll we we'll probably not don't have time to go through them all individually, but. Um, yeah. So you, you have St Jude's goalkeeper, you have Paul Copeland, you have Kevin Dias, Paul Nixon of Ballyhagan, Paul McComaskey um, of Down and Queens, Chris Guckey in St Jude's, you have Justin Crozier, who you played with in Queens, John McCormack, James McCormack, Kieran Toner, James Lavery and Stephen Falker. So you have a fairly strong subs bench there as well, Paul. I suppose who was the closest to getting in or who was the hardest to turn away from your 15? Uh, probably Chris Goggin there from St. Jude's would have been seriously, uh, seriously close to the team uh, and uh, because he was again he was a great player he always picked up the opposition's best forward but he was so good at going forward he's actually similar enough to Arne Kiernan in terms of the way he was going forward he would have been quicker than Arne Kiernan like you want to see the speed of Chris Goggin was unbelievable his tackling was really good just injuries were his biggest killer, but he's still playing now, and he's 33 or 34. Uh, just going, like, Paul Croton, great goalie. Kevin Das, everyone knows who Kevin Das is there. Uh, Kevin went to Australia and, I suppose, got a bad injury in Australia, came back, got himself an unbelievable neck again. Great year for our man, 2014, then got a bad injury again in 2015. So, uh, Kevin would have... There, thereabouts in that team because of 07 and under 21s, he was the best player in our team. I would say him as well as uh, the three lads at the end there, Kieran Toner, Lavery, and Falker. Would have played underage with James Lavery and Stephen Falker because we were joined with Mahari at underage. So, would have had a good relationship with James Lavery. He was midfield along with myself and Stephen was there. 
few years younger than us, but they always would have been playing. But under 21s, them three lads, Toner, Lavery, and Fogger, were, were seriously. Uh, so was, Paul Nixon was a, a great player and still is at the minute. He took a sabbatical from Ballyhagan the last year, but hopefully he's back this year. But first cousin of Paddy McKeever, both footed, strong, great in the air. Hopefully he'll be back. And so was the two McCormicks there. Uh, James would be a cousin of John's there. So James is like the new generation coming along. You, you remember him, Sean, from last year against White Cross. Like, I would say, I'm going to be honest, see if there was a couple of years behind James and he was able to do the university thing, like play for Jordan's time or whatever, and have a good round cup in Segerson Cup. James might have made that team there, but just at the minute, the way things are, like, but he is an unbelievable talent. Like, I haven't seen too many people even get near him, and you've, you've witnessed it yourself there in terms of even the teams that are that wee bit ahead of us in the divisions. He was able to step it up and just sort of lastly there maybe John McCormick like it's funny that people maybe sometimes some some people don't know who John McCormick is but John McCormick was probably the best uh, underage footballer in Arma uh, until he was a bit of minor uh, John there both fought it, a bit like the three boys in the full forward now uh, whenever he was the second year in St. Pat's Arma, he played centre half forward for the fourth year team and won the Ulster A schools competition and scored five points out of ten points, I think it was. A uh, serious footballer. Uh, but just, again, injury sort of caught up with John there as well. But uh, Paul McComsky there would have been close enough to, from a down perspective as well, play with him in Queens, but he would have scored three points in all Ireland final for down in 2010. So good good, good enough sub bounce there, I think, now that would... Uh, we give their nearly make a wee team by, them, by themselves there. But well, Paul, decent. just to finish up, we finish every um, podcast with sort of two quick fire questions. And I suppose yeah. the first one um, was who who from your, your dream team would you learn the most from or who, who was maybe an inspiration to you that you would have played with that, um, you know, sort of you would have learned from you know, your different positions, you said like the likes of Queens, you played centre half back, midfield, or my you could have been one half forward or midfield. Like who who that you played with did you learn most from? I'd say I learned most of uh, McGrain, I'd say McGrain and maybe maybe Mark Sweeney. Two of them guys like uh again go back to McGrain there, what I said earlier about him. McGrain always plays about doing the thing simple, right? And it, he was a massive advocate of that. He would have been talking about practicing up against the wall with the ball and stuff, I guess. And he would have been saying this 20 years ago. And it's funny that people are going back to this now and saying, oh, we need to put a wall ball up, uh, our ball wall up uh, at, the, at the club for basic skills, for fisting. And, and, and like, the rain would have been saying that 20 years ago. And I suppose from that side of things, he would have been inspirational from that side of things. From the near sort of perspective of GA, Mark Sweeney would be that like, I would have got on really well. Still do get on really well with Sweeney, would be a good friend of mine. And But we always bounce off ideas and thinking about how we could improve ourselves or what we can do to maybe what's different uh, than what other teams are doing and come up maybe with uh, plays or it could be uh, maybe say we were in charge of the defence side of things for St. Jude's, uh, he'd be saying, what do you think of this? And I'd be saying, well, I think of that or whatever. And then the same way, you'd be saying, right, around the middle, how can we win more breaking ball? Because the main thing would have been uh, breaking ball and stuff like that. He would have been saying, what do you think? And he, he probably would have empowered you to think that uh, you're helping along the way as well, which gave you more confidence as well. I suppose that's, that's the side of things. Like all those guys in that team, uh, there would be inspiring confidence with you as well and they'd be wanting you to improve yourself but for me McGrain and Sweeney there would probably be the two there uh, that would be guys there that would be inspirational as such. Um, well, Paul, um, uh, the second question then um, we have for you is in terms of accuracy who's the most accurate player you would have played with like I suppose in terms of accuracy, there's the shooting, obviously, but you have the likes of Aaron Kieran in there, who was a free taker, but also coming forward was very accurate at kick passing, Paul McGrain as well. Um, 
Jordan Keane, I think, used to hit the penalties for Derry. So, like, there's another bit of accuracy. Who would have been the most accurate you played with? I would say on the, those successful teams, right, and just based on those successful teams, probably, probably uh, maybe Paul, Paul McComiskey from a Queen's perspective. And I would say Stephen Falker from an Armagh perspective. And the reason choosing them is McComsky was a serious man in Queens whenever I was there for practice, and he always would have practiced practice. But say, for example, what he lacked in, in height, he made up for in power and in speed. And uh, again, a bit like Steve McDonnell, he would have done things at 100%, 100 men an hour all the time. But he would have been very accurate at it too. Uh, and unplayable. Was he was unplayable? Paul McComsky, whenever we were playing, uh, Sigerson, especially in the second uh, second year, he got injured in his, I think his third year, a bad back and in injury. But uh, the second year, he was unplayable. And then, even the All Ireland final, he scored three points to play against Cork, against that great Cork team. Uh, he's a brilliant player. And Stephen Falker uh, was on the 21s, again, a real successful team because we would have been. Uh, playing along with each other then as well and he would have been playing against me uh, against Jordanstown and stuff like that uh, but he was again seriously accurate he maybe I think he scored one five in the Ulster final and he got man and match in the Ulster on the 21 final but again practice like, and, and you're talking there like even now Stephen Falker is an absolute uh, machine and Billy like Aiden and stuff like Aiden will be very lucky not to make, make that team as well but these guys are at the top level of their clubs even still and staff is going to be 33 like you know what I mean 30 32 33 and he's no he's no way getting going down like he's really like just consistently going up and getting better uh, but again there's a real passion there from those guys that are driven and they're constantly looking to improve uh, so it's not side of things you'll be looking at McConaughey and Staff and Falker and that's not taking away the guys we talked about like Clarkie and Brown Mann and Steve McDonald it's just that those sort of specific teams because like, you could probably name that whole whole team in terms of their accuracy and their and their drive and their inspiration but particularly those couple of guys just for what they did within those teams that's great paul um that's all we have time for and we'll be back next wednesday with another um club edition of the dream team so thanks very much for coming on paul and discussing your dream team with us Oh, well, thanks, Sean. Thanks very much for having me.